All right, so I suggested that I was going to provide a supplemental video for you to better understand how modern thermodynamics ties in to what you might have been reading in traditional thermodynamics books where uh, there's a description of the change in entropy of the universe or the super system, a change in entropy of the surroundings, and a change in entropy of the system. How do these things tie together and how does that help me uh, to link together modern thermodynamics with that perspective. And really, the example that we like to bring forward is, is that of a leaf. Uh, a leaf is a system that is a really classic non-equilibrium open system where we have heat and work uh, being exchanged, across, energy exchange across the boundary. We have light passing that boundary, which is its own energy source. We have mass going in and out. It's, it's a really fascinating system. And we can use that information uh, later in, uh, say, uh, Professor Lvov's EGE 436, Modern Thermodynamics for Energy Systems. We can use that uh, throughout our basic understanding of life systems, of, of uh, the way that the planet interacts with the atmosphere to provide a, a warming effect. Uh, there, there, there are uh, numerous examples that use modern thermodynamics, and I just want to tie them together for you. So let's go to the next slide. So first things first, I would like to um, bring up the second law of thermodynamics and in terms of the Clausius inequality, and then bring up the Prigogine formalism. So let's go to the Clausius uh, inequality right now. So the Clausius inequality is really that fundamental second law equation. We call it the Clausius inequality, but it's the second law equation uh, itself that is both the inequality and uh, for irreversible processes and the equality for reversible processes. Uh, and I'm going to lay it out for you in differential form. So here we are. Uh, the extensive entropy change, instantaneous rate of entropy change is going to be greater than or equal to the inexact uh, change, instantaneous change in heat relative to the temperature uh, for reversible and irreversible processes. Okay, that is the Clausius inequality. Um, the irreversible process, once again, is the dissipative process. It is energy is being dissipated, energy is being spread out or reorganized if we run it in the other direction, whereas reversible processes are non-dissipative, meaning that they're the best possible uh, way to do uh, a given process without spreading out the energy. Okay, So um, jumping ahead a little bit, the irreversible processes are going to be thought of in modern thermodynamics as thermodynamic forces linked with thermodynamic flows. We're going to have force F linked with a change in uh, a, a certain parameter X, uh, a dx. Now, that brings in, uh, we'll come to that, but right now we bring in the next way to think of the second law, the modern thermodynamics way, which is the Prigogine formalism. This is Ilya Prigogine, Nobel Prize winner, uh, chemist, uh, who really made some fascinating um, work in terms of communicating entropy change as the sum of two parts. So we have the second equation where we have ds is equal to de plus di and the, they're the des plus dis where the e stands for the entropy change due to the exchange of matter or energy across the boundary. Okay, Dis, the internal or the, the the part of the entropy change that's only tied to entropy changes inside of the system, nothing crossing the boundary, is what we would state the entropy change due to uncompensated transformation or energy produced, or entropy, produced by irreversible processes in the interior of the system. So E for exchange, I for interior uh, is a way to start thinking about it. Now, all of this sounds great. But how do we tie it together with older formalisms of describing entropy? So let's do our little 19th century to 21st century translation guide. Okay. So we're going to compare, uh, in this case, what you would see in your uh, chapter 3 of Koretsky uh, with chapter 3 of uh, Kandapudi and modern thermodynamics. Okay. 
So let's move forward. Start with the first law of thermodynamics, which is going to be uh, a change in internal energy. I'm going to frame that only in terms of Q because Q becomes really important to us. And so delta U as an integral form of a change in internal energy, delta U minus W is equal to Q. And at constant pressure, let's say we're only looking at um, pressure volume work at constant pressure, Q is going to be equal to delta U plus PdV, or P delta V, excuse me. Now, going to uh, the textbook by Koretsky, equation 3.3, we have a fundamental kind of comparison of the change in entropy of the universe, or uh, other people would call it the super system, is equal to the change in entropy of the system plus the change in energy of the surroundings. And, and many of you are having quite a time figuring out how that actually works. Uh, so I'm going to provide a translation for you. So first, let's look at the entropy change of the surroundings. So the entropy change of the surroundings is solely tied to the mass and the energy that is crossing the boundary. And it's in our case, it's going to be the negative of our change in, the, in entropy tied to energy uh, um, and mass going across the boundary. So it would be minus delta ES. So now I put this in the integral form. Let's think about a closed system where we don't have mass exchange. And so that's just going to be minus Q over the temperature, uh, very specifically at the boundary. Okay, Because we're all tracking at the boundary right now, which is why I put TB. You can see TE for the external temperature or something like that uh, in many of our textbooks. Very specifically, we're talking about like the temperature as it exists at the boundary. Replace Q with our first law relationship, and now we have negative delta U plus P delta V over the temperature at the boundary. That is, the, uh, in a closed system, the entropy change at the surroundings. That's my first translation. Now, let's look at what the system is doing. Well, as I look at the Prigogine formalism and turn it into integral form, I'm going to have the change in entropy from state 1 to state 2 of my system is equal to the change in entropy related to energy and mass exchanging across the boundary, delta ES, plus the internal entropy change tied to irreversible processes, delta IS. Now, we have the change in entropy of the universe is equal to the system change plus the surroundings change. Let's just add the different parts of our equations together and we end up that the change in entropy of the universe is the sum of the internal ent entropy changes. So equation 3.10, if we were to look at it on page um, 140 of Koretsky, you find out that the entropy change of the universe must be greater than or equal to zero, as does the internal entropy change uh, of the system. Okay. It's, again, if, if you start looking at this, you realize that the Prigogine formalism is actually much easier because we're actually tracking only what's happening inside the system and, and, and the exchange of the boundary. We don't have to think about the surroundings, so to speak. Here's the big and. What does the internal entropy change, uh, it, if it has to be equal to or greater than or equal to zero, we also know that that key part of entropy change inside the system is related to forces and a displacement, a displacement of some parameter x. And if we were to do it with respect to time, we'd have dx dt, and that would be a flow, a current. Okay? So we have forces and flows that come together. All right. So now that I've got my translation, let's think about the basic rules in modern thermodynamics as they apply to different systems. So the first system is of course going to be a isolated system where I have no energy exchange, no matter exchange across the boundary. I have an isolated system. DES in the differential form is equal to zero. But everything inside the system could be greater than or equal to zero. If I have a closed system, now I'm going to have DES is equal to the change in the energy that exchanges across the boundary, which is kind of redundant, 
over the temperature at the boundary or the external temp or the temperature uh, that would have been exchanged. And so there we have our du plus pdv. And again, the internal entropy change is the same, greater than or equal to zero. Okay. And there's my QE is equal to the negative of QI. It's a lot easier to follow in this way. Finally, we're left with the open system that has an energetic term and a matter-based term, or a mass-based term. And we're going to get into what that matter-based term is uh, later in the semester. It's going to be tied to a change in the sums of chemical potential, that's the mu, related to a change in the, the moles moving across the boundary and related to the temperature. So open systems is set up that way. And in this way, I can see that really all that, remember, all that change of energy in the universe is tied to those irreversible processes inside the system. Everything else is DES. And, uh, and we can solve for this with the same thinking. We just don't have to use as complicated of a framework as, as changing my focus to outside the system having a negative sign, and inside the system having a positive sign. It, it gets uh, quite complicated uh, when you don't have this pre formalism, which actually makes things a lot easier to keep a consistent uh, sign convention, to keep a consistent uh, modern perspective. Okay. When I do have an open system, there is one note, and that is that du plus pdv is not necessarily equal to dq for an open system. Uh, and that's really because uh, flowing matter has internal energy and kinetic energy that must be included in the uh, DES of matter. Uh, and we'll deal with that later. So these are just some general uh, rules and uh, uh, some general assumptions that uh, Koretsky has uh, set up. Uh, in his special cases. All right. Next, I'd like to know about um, ultimately this idea of irreversible processes. This is the modern thermodynamic way of thinking about it. We have these things called irreversible processes. They are tied to uh, my delta IS or my DIS uh, internal entropy change and um, an irreversible process can be thought of as a thermodynamic force linked with a thermodynamic flow or a displacement uh, at, at, in some metric X. All right? So you're going to see a DIS and this is an extensive form now is going to be F DX. There's my force, thermodynamic force. The dx is my thermodynamic flow or displacement, and it's irreversible. It has a certain directionality. It's going to be positive or negative, right? All right. So hopping ahead, you're going to see that we have examples of this force and flow. With thermal diffusion, you have a temperature gradient that is uh, the thermodynamic force driving irreversible flow of heat. Okay, So you have my force is F is the uh, 1 over Tc minus 1 over Th. That's my force. That's my temperature gradient. And my flow is going to be dq, the heat that actually goes across the boundary. Uh, whereas the second example is going to be chemical diffusion where I have a concentration gradient that is the thermodynamic force, uh, what we would call chemical potential, and it's divided by temperature, uh, and we ultimately end up that that is driving the irreversible flow of matter, the flow of moles across a boundary. Let's go to the next slide. If I were to take that flow, dx, with respect to a time, I'd have a current, and currents um, in this case, uh, can only be positive. So we've got uh, the force gives me the directionality sign convention uh, uh, associated with the flow. It's a or a rate of flow. Uh, we know that power is voltage times current, uh, or voltage times current density. Uh, inside of Koretsky, in chapter three, you have the definition of open systems uh, equation three point one five, which is very very closely. Uh, 
describing um, the same equations that I just gave you for translation, but in terms of uh, rates. And if I have a change in um, entropy with respect to time, what we call that is entropy production. And it's given that letter uh, sigma i. So the definition, the mathematical definition of entropy production, excuse me, is uh, entropy change with respect to time. And it's the sum of forces times the rate of flows. Uh, it's still valid for the Clausius inequality. And it all ties this stuff together. Now, you have seen in your reading of Kandapudi in Chapter 3 a description of how a system could be divided into chunks. So I could take a macroscopic system. In this case, they're just using an isolated system, no entropy exchange across the, the surroundings. Uh, so DES is equal to 0. If I look at just that system and I slice that system in half, I have uh, a subsystem 1 and a subsystem 2, all with entropy changes. Uh, what I would find out is that each subsystem would have to in obey the Clausius inequality. It would have to be the internal change of entropy in one half is greater than or equal to zero, and the other half is greater than or equal to zero as well. Effectively, all the areas must add together, and so that every macroscopic region, every chunk of a room, uh, will have uh, irreversible entropy production, and that will be positive if the internal entropy change. So the internal entropy change is additive across macroscopic regions. Okay? You can pause to think about this, compare it with your reading. Now I'm going to go on to the next slide, which is microscopic. So if I were to take, instead of regions, instead of big regions, I consider the entire sum of processes, and processes are going to be P, letter P in subscript at the molecular level, say inside of a leaf, inside of our bodies, inside of the chemistries of our bodies, consider two or more processes that are taking pl place simultaneously in the same region. You have a heat pump happening at the same time as a heat engine is happening. Okay, You'll have multiple things happening at the same time in the same region. In that case, and this is not in your reading, this is the, the, the way that we think of uh, modern thermodynamics, it's the next step, it's possible to have negative entropy production. Meaning that one of those processes can be negative as long as the other coupled process might be positive. And then the sum of those processes are going to be greater than or equal to zero. So you'll see that uh, when I have a sum of internal entropy change processes or a sum of entropy production those processes added together microscopically will net end up being greater than or equal to zero and will still obey the Clausius inequality. But I can tie them, to, but I can tie them together and get uh, organizing of energy, right? This is tightening up the spread of energy, which would be my DIS1 less than zero coupled together with something else that is spreading out the energy again, DIS2 greater than zero. It's just that that spreading out of energy has to be a greater quantity than the organizing of energy is in a negative sense, such that the sum of them is greater than or equal to zero. This is ultimately going to play out when we get to descriptions of what we call Gibbs free energy uh, later on in the semester. The idea of these microscopic processes is called thermodynamic coupling. Now, remember how we were talking about compensation and, and that, that nothing will happen without compensation. Well, coupling, thermodynamic coupling, is basically this compensation that uh, Rudolf Clausius had pointed out in 1865. It was later neglected by textbooks. Modern thermodynamics brings it right back in as a as a perfect way to describe life, to the way to describe plants, it, it describes uh, the way that our fluorescent light bulbs work, it describes the way that our light emitting diodes work. They're tied to thermodynamic coupling. And so it's a really big concept. I gotta marry together, uh, this is basically the, the etymology of the word coupling is to be married. So we're marrying together positive and negative irreversible processes 
and, a, and call, it, call that thermodynamic coupling, which is also called compensation, and it leads to non-equilibrium thermodynamics tied to energy conversion devices, which is exactly what uh, is all of our work in uh, our energy systems research and our energy systems education throughout the Department of Energy and Mineral Engineering. You would also call this dissipative thermodynamics because basically any irreversible process is also called a dissipative process. And you can go back and look earlier to see where I described irreversible processes as dissipative. But this is not where I'm creating one half of a room and the other half of a room being positive and negative. No, no, no. I'm running both in the same space uh, microscopically, and I can add them together to create a net thermodynamic coupling. Now, the entropy increase principle that we would see with the internal entropy change, with the change of entropy of the universe, is uh, so that simple entropy increase is restricted to isolated systems or adiabatic systems, um, but it's not really suitable to fully describe open systems, the systems that we are really dealing with in life, the way that I deal with my research in solar energy. And the meaning here is that uh, one of the takeaways is that the greenhouse effect, you know, when the sun is shining on the planet, the planet is ultimately re-radiating re that light back out, some of that light is being trapped and is maintaining a warm, comfortable temperature, uh, that effect and the increase of uh, greenhouse gases that do change the performance of the greenhouse effect, they do not break the second law of thermodynamics. They do not break the Clausius inequality. Um, so there is no perpetual motion machine happening with the sun heating up the planet and the planet re-radiating out a portion of that energy and some of that energy being trapped and ultimately uh, warming or changing the ultimately the climate of the planet over time. There's nothing wrong with that in the second law of thermodynamics and anyone who you might see posting on that really doesn't understand thermodynamics. The other side of it is that organisms themselves, like plants, are not perpetual motion machines. They are obeying the Clausius inequality, but they're coupling together processes. They're marrying processes together to get uh, marrying photosynthesis together with sugar production, uh, climbing up a ladder using the external pump of the light from the sun to create the energy that will then fall down the chute as uh, sugars that ultimately can be burned uh, for life. Uh, they're not perpetual motion machines. They're normal uh, energy conversion devices. Uh, other examples of thermodynamic coupling are low pressure diamond growth. So you don't, you no longer need to grow diamonds at extremely high pressures. You, you instill a uh, strongly non-equilibrium growth scenario and you use dis dissipative thermodynamics to your advantage and you can grow diamonds, um, which we have been doing now for, for many years. Um, but, you know, making diamonds at low pressure used to be thought of as a thermodynamically impossible scenario. Using 19th century thermodynamics, indeed it was, but using 20th and 21st century thermodynamic understandings and one might say the understanding of Rudolf Clausius from 1865, you're doing it just fine. So if I couple chemical reactions together, I have photosynthesis. If I have a couple chemical reactions together, I have electrochemistry for batteries. If I couple physical fields like magnetic fields or electromagnetic fields together, and they are external to my system, but I can couple them in to create photovoltaics, to create magnetic memory storage, to create fuel cells, to create ultrasound and sonar that we find in our piezoelectric devices. This is like the entire body of, of modern thermodynamics allows us to do all the really cool stuff that we love about modern society. Exciting stuff. So if I think about this and I take the relationship between what is a spontaneous irreversible process and the change in internal energy, U, related to Q and W, that's the first law part, I can tie the first law to the second law. So in a closed system, I can move my temperature denominator over to the right side of the equation and in, in, an, in an irreversible process, right, this is spontaneous and irreversible, there's no equal sign here, I have TDS 
is greater than the inexact differential of uh, squirrely dq, right? So the heat absorbed by the system in an irreversible process is going to be that squirrely dq, the, the inexact instantaneous change in heat. The temperature that we're talking about is the temperature at the boundary, oftentimes related to the external temperature or the temperature of the surroundings. And then I link that to the first law, and I see that du is equal to dq plus dw plus dw prime, where uh, dw prime is non-mechanical work and dw is mechanical work or shaft-based work. And I can start replacing meaning with dq and dw and so forth. And so if I combine the first law and the second laws in differential form for spontaneous irreversible processes, you see that I get the change in internal energy must be less than temperature times the instantaneous change in entropy minus pressure times the inst instantaneous change in volume plus the instantaneous inexact change, inexact differential change in non-mechanical work. This is just a revelation. This is an exciting thing because now we've tied first and second laws together and we've got equations that have parts to them that we can start moving around with uh, and solving a lot of problems with both for code breaking and both for understand, better understanding energy conversion devices. If I use my relationship of dq to t ds with enthalpy change, now I can look at uh, that state-based relationship in equation 2.18 where I have enthalpy is defined as u, internal energy, plus pressure times volume. This is no integral form of a change in states. This is no derivative, uh, differential form of a change in a state. This is the mathematical definition of enthalpy related to internal energy and pressure and volume. And you see that graphical equation, uh, or graphical representation of the equation just to the left of equation 2.18. So if U, if internal energy is in sentence form described as the capacity to do work, any work, and exchange heat or exchange heat acro energy across the boundary, and enthalpy H is in sentence form just defined as the capacity to do non-mechanical work and release heat, then I can link these guys together. And I can show how dH is related to du and replace du with the definition of du. Right? So you'll see on the lower left, dH is equal to du plus PdV. Okay? Or that would be you know uh, internal energy change plus flow work on, at, under isobaric constraints. Let's replace du with my, uh, again, this is non-mechanical work, is, has been, is going to zero. So du is going to be equal to, by the first law, du is equal to squirrely dq plus squirrely dw. We already know that the inexact differential of heat is TDS. The inexact differential of mechanical work is minus PDV. And so I pop that into the equation. Uh, and I start seeing where PDVs cancel each other out, and I'm left with the equation for the instantaneous change of enthalpy is equal to TDS plus VDP. That's under isochoric constraints. Pretty exciting stuff. The last thing I leave you with to think about this is what is temperature times a change, instantaneous change in entropy? And when we're actually thinking of it in terms of energy. Well, uh, with a if we consider a system process that's all friction or like a sensible heat change or a phase change, uh, then I have no work. And then I can have du is equal to q. Right? We've had this constraint before at constant volume. Then tds is going to be equal to du, and du dt is going to be ultimately a thermal current. I can, I can represent T, I can move it back over to uh, be part of a, uh, of a change in DU. And that's what you're seeing right over here. You're seeing 1 over T and a rate of change of DU, DU dt, where the partial change in internal energy with respect to the partial change in uh, time 
and that's equal to ds dt. I can take that equation, dis dt, and I can relate it to the gradient in the temperature, or the negative of the gradient in the temperature times current. That's going to give me my external entropy change with respect to time. Tie it only into the internal entropy change, and I will have the positive gradient of 1 over the temperature, that is my force or my thermal potential, and my heat current, JQ, is my flow. And I end up with my entropy production tied to the 1 over the temperature, the gradient of 1 over the temperature, times the flow of heat. If I think about Fourier's law of heat conduction, I will find out that I have that same functional uh, basis of negative kappa uh, times the gradient of T, where kappa is the coefficient of heat conduction. This all brings together entropy to Fourier's law of heat conduction. Uh, it's a really exciting thing. So you see that heat conduction or uh, heat, con heat flow, JQ, can be solved in terms of the coefficient of heat conduction times the uh, gradient of the temperature. And that all is tied into 1 over the temperature in the entropy change. At the end, the change in entropy with respect to the change in time is going to be the sum of forces times the currents. Clausius' in inequality, the second law of thermodynamics, means that that sum of forces times currents is going to be greater than or equal to zero. All right. Good luck in your studies. That's what I'm leaving you with for your kind of introduction to modern thermodynamics. Feel free to come back to this anytime you want. Uh, good luck again.